Okay, so back to the greedy uh, method. Oh yes, before I forget, actually, I got a, a good question about polynomial multiplications. Uh, you know, there are two types of polynomial multiplication going on in what we have done. The first one is uh, when, we used, uh, when we used it to multiply large integers. In this case, uh, we split the original uh, uh, number into several slices, right? And we call this uh, A0, A1, sorry, this will be then A0, say this is A1, this is A2, and this is A3. And then we form the polynomial PA that looks like this. It's uh, um, PA of X is equal to A0 plus A1X plus A2X uh, squared uh, plus um, 0, 1, 2, 3 plus A3X cubed. Right, And then if we call this number A, uh, if each of these has uh, k bits, right, then uh, A is simply equal PA at the value 2 to the k. Why? Because if I substitute 2 to the k, then A3 will be multiplied by 2 to the 3k, which means it will have k bits shift, right? So um, uh, 2 to the 3k uh, times uh, uh, A3 looks like this, uh, A3 and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so forth, right? So this uh, 2k, 2 to the power k just shifts uh, the, the number so that when you sum them up, you get precisely A. Now here, K can be arbitrarily large, but the number of slices, in this case uh, four slices, is fixed. So polynomial PA is uh, of uh, degree uh, three. Evaluating a polynomial of degree three at values from minus three to three is doable in linear time, right? Because uh, uh, simply we are looking PA of say uh, um, minus three, well that would be uh, A0 uh, minus three A1 plus nine A2 plus uh, minus 27 A3, right? And this is just linear combination of with small coefficients. So it's computable in linear time. And we have only um, uh, seven many values to substitute. So in this case, polynomial evaluation is in linear time, simply because the degree of the polynomial is fixed and uh, um, only A's can be arbitrarily large, right? So the number of bits here is arbitrarily large. When you are doing fast Fourier transform to multiply two polynomials, now notice, so here, uh, this polynomial evaluation is within the recursive loop. So each evaluation is repeated for every run of the recursion. However, when you multiply polynomials, say I didn't show you this, but it's possible to do. There is a tricky part with doing with the carry, but one can use FFT to multiply polynomials in time, uh, sorry, to multiply large numbers in times n times log n times log log n. This log log n comes from dealing with the carry. So it's a bit of a complication, so I didn't want to go into this. But uh, there, 
the evaluation is outside of the loop. So if you would use FFT to multiply your numbers, two large numbers, you would not split it in just, say, four pieces. You will take something that can nicely fit in the register of your machine and when you square it also to be so, uh, so that a reasonable computations with A will not cause uh, uh, overflow. And, and then you split this into AN, AN minus one, all the way to A zero. Now each of these has constant number of bits. So if the number is large, the number of pieces will be large. So your polynomial will be now of degree um, n plus one, right? Because it will look like this, uh, a zero plus a one x plus, plus uh, a n x to the n, right? Now these guys uh, have say uh, m b, say, eight bits a, a byte, for example. Um, uh, but the, their number can be arbitrarily large because your input numbers can be arbitrarily large. So in this case, you will have to evaluate a polynomial of arbitrary large degree at roots of unity of high order. This is what FFT does in n log n many steps. So here, the operation is linear in the number of bits of k. Here, the evaluation is n log n, not in the number of bits of a, but in the degree of the polynomial, in the number of slices. Right, so, uh, and notice here, um, here, the evaluation is recursive, uh, not the entire loop, right? Because we use FFT to pass from a polynomial PA into the values, uh, all the values PA at omega, say, n to the k, right? So this now is done in a divide and conquer way. So recursion lives only here then you do one single polynomial multiplication in, uh, in the, uh, the value form. So you would have PB of omega NK, right? And you would multiply this and then N log N to go back to the polynomial PC. So the complexity is here because the polynomial is of fixed degree the complexity is linear in the number of bits of A, right? Uh, of, uh, and here, uh, number of bits of A, so here the degree of the polynomial is fixed, here the number of bits of this guy are fixed to say eight bits, but the evaluation is in n log n time in the degree of the polynomial n, right? So here this, tradition, this transition is divide and conquer recursive. There, the whole procedure is recursive because the evaluation at these small numbers of uh, polynomials of low degree is iteratively uh, repeated. Uh, you get the difference? I got an email with this question because in the literature, usually uh, what people consider is multiplication of polynomial in time complexity of the degree of the polynomial. And that's n log n. But here, in Karatsupa trick, the degree is fixed, right? But it is part of an iterative loop, right? Um, so uh, if you read carefully the notes with this in mind, uh, I believe uh, everything will be clear. Do you have any questions about this? You know, this is non-trivial stuff, so please take your time and uh, read carefully uh, the notes. Okay, going back to uh, greedy. By the way, another question. You see, this picture is unrelated to that one. This is a generic setup. You have a bunch of activities that you want to choose largest number of non-conflicting activities, 
And this is just a particular count example for this attempt. So choosing the shortest activity which does not conflict with the previous ones. The green ones are those accepted and the red ones are those that are uh, refused. And as we mentioned uh, with all this example, it's kind of sometimes tricky to find what is the right uh, quantity to be greedy with respect to, and we saw that to do that, uh, you would uh, always choose the activity that ends uh, earliest, eliminate uh, all the activities that conflict with that one, and then again choose next uh, that is the earliest non-conflicting uh, that ends the earliest, uh, right? Now, how, what is the time complexity of this algorithm? So you pick one that ends the, with the earliest uh, fi finishing date. Uh, you remove uh, conflicting activities. Obviously, you handle every activity only once. Does it, is it really all N? There is a, a slippery point here that... Uh, so you are given a list of activities. Nothing else is with as pairs of uh, starting and finishing time. In order to do this algorithm, what do you have to do first? Exactly. So the list need not be sorted. So actually this algorithm runs in time n log n because you have to sort them according to uh, starting, uh, sorry, finishing time. But then you have to look for conflicting ones. So you have to check the starting time uh, to eliminate all those that starting time is before that finishing time. So you would the, uh, think how you would implement that. Probably the simplest would be to keep two lists uh, or even three lists, right? The original list uh, and then one list uh, sort them with respect to finishing time and another sort them with respect to starting time. So first you take the first element according to the finishing time then you go to the list sorted with respect to starting time and eliminate uh, all those until the starting time becomes larger than the finishing time of the first activity. And you go back and forth, right? So this is kind of a typical mistake. Uh, it, not, it is not said here that the activities are sorted in any way, uh, right? So um, keep in mind that... Uh, um, you have to sort to apply this algorithm. And this is one good reason you would not skip that if you implement this algorithm, right? Because when you see that you want to uh, pick one with the earliest uh, finishing time, where is it? Uh, so you have to first sort uh, to make the algorithm work. So it's a really very good idea uh, for all of the algorithms that uh, we will be doing it if you implement them um, at home, uh, uh, just to, because then you really understand the algorithm only after you implement it. But we have so much material and hopefully you get enough programming in other courses that here we will, uh, um, we will focus on uh, uh, design techniques. But as I say, you know, you, you, you just nothing beats uh, um, implementation as a final test whether you understand the algorithm because it forces you to think about every single detail that you might otherwise miss. Okay, so now, um, just very quickly, uh, this uh, problem is uh, one of the examples that uh, uh, proof, uh, you see there are several false leads uh, because we try to you know, find first activity that is conflicting with the fewest number of activities and this, then we found counter example that it didn't work. So the only way, excuse me, to make sure that your algorithm is correct is to give a quote unquote a proof. Maybe we should not say proof, but a justification why the algorithm is correct because most of the time, I wouldn't call it math proof, it's kind of uh, common sense, but rigorous uh, proof. 
And uh, the technique here is called cut and paste, right? Why is it called cut and paste? Well, you proceed as follows. Assume that I have a, uh, uh, a better solution than what Greedy produces. Uh, then you want to show that that's impossible. So most of the time, counterpositive works. You know, you assume opposite and you derive an inconsistency. So since uh, this solution is better uh, than the greedy solution, if you try to run your greedy algorithm on that solution, eventually you have to hit a point uh, in which the greedy choice is uh, uh, violated. You pick the first such point. So for example, here obviously this was chosen in a greedy way, right? But then uh, here we chose this uh, um, activity which ends uh, after this other non-conflicting activity. So uh, cut and paste. Cut is, so you take whatever is compliant with the greedy, then you find the place where greedy is violated and you show how to replace this uh, choice with the greedy choice without reducing the quality of the solution, right? So for example here, if I drop this activity and instead take this one, clearly I am throwing away one activity, taking uh, one activity so the number of activities did not change. It's still this optimal number. And notice that this, if the old set was, uh, um, was uh, conflict free, so will the new one. Why? Well, it cannot have conflicts to the left because it's compliant with the greedy method, how we uh, choose. On the other hand, it cannot have conflicts to the right because it ends prior to the ending of what was uh, uh, there before we did the surgery, right? And because it ends before this one ends and this one didn't intersect any of subsequently chosen activities, so thus this one will be consistent as well. And of course now you can keep iterating each time replacing one activity by another activity without reducing, uh, keeping it consistent and without dropping the number of activities and in the end you will get that the number of activities of the starting solution must be exactly the same as the greedy solution. Maybe it's a different uh, uh, choice of activities, but the number must be the same because voila, we showed that, uh, um, greedy, that we can always morph any consistent solution to a greedy uh, solution. Yes? Uh, you always choose not the shortest, but one that ends first, right? So, for example, there, <coughs> there can be a short activity, say, he, well, say here, right? So this is, this is uh, no, that's not a good example. Um, the, so it could be one activity that is shorter and, uh, but protrudes a little bit here, uh, you wouldn't take that one, but you take one that ends earliest because ending earliest is a guarantee that the, you will keep it conflict free. Even if it protrudes a little bit, no matter if it's uh, shorter, maybe it will collide uh, with what's next. So always choose the one that ends earliest. Uh, okay, it doesn't have to be to start later because assume they say that this activity uh, ended up somewhere here below the red point, right? Now this activity, red activity would start earlier, right? Um, but it would, uh, right, so this, uh, sorry, my hands are shaking because I'm an old man, so... Um, <laughs> So here, uh, you see, if, uh, say, this activity here, maybe it started 
at this point, oops, at uh, this point that is halfway uh, uh, at uh, this act red activity. Now, it, this activity would end, uh, would start earlier, but uh, it uh, um, also, but it has shorter, um, sorry, it, uh, um, it can be even longer, right, if it starts earlier, say, it starts earlier two hours, but uh, finishes uh, here um, uh, three hours before that, right? So, um, or say just one hour uh, before the end point here, so it would be longer than this one. So it's not necessarily the shorter uh, one, um, because it doesn't have to start bef uh, after this activity started. So be careful uh, with that. So do you understand the strategy? When you vary, that's one, and it's kind of the most frequently used method in greedy. Cut and paste, you find the first place where the greedy is violated, and you do the surgery, you show that if you replace this part of the solution with the greedy choice, you will not decrease the quality of the solution. And then proceeding in this way, you can morph your original uh, supposedly better solution in the greedy solution with the same number of uh, uh, activities. And this is, of course, a, a contradiction. But you have to be very, very careful what is the criterion, because it's so easy to, to make a, a mistake. So, we saw what the time complexity is, the sorting does. We saw the second. Okay, this is a very, very nice one, right? Uh, because it has several tricks uh, involved here. So you are given a list of jobs, uh, AI. So assume that these are your homeworks, right? And for each of the jobs, you are given a deadline. And uh, you are also given um, duration time, which I called here uh, TI. So duration time TI and deadline DI. You can do only one job at any time, and all jobs have to be completed. If a job is completed at a finishing time that is after the deadline, then we say that it has incurred lateness uh, fi minus di, right? So you, if you have, uh, um, so assume uh, that you have to pay the penalty for every lateness, your task, is, say you lose certain number of points uh, on each homework uh, that is uh, completed after the deadline. Not everyone is generous like Uncle Alex, right? Some people take off marks, right? So um, what you want to then minimize uh, is how large is the maximal penalty. You want to minimize how much, uh, you will, uh, uh, how much your uh, grade will drop across all the assignments. Uh, Right, so you look for the largest latents and you want to minimize it. Now, that's a really, really tricky one. And uh, first trick is, and it's actually not that easy to see it, but sometimes the problem has superfluous information. Namely, what we are going to show is uh, that uh, you ignore the duration of jobs. You totally ignore how long it takes to complete each job. And you schedule the jobs in the increasing order of deadlines. So you first do the job that has the earliest deadline, then you do the job that has the second earliest deadline, and so forth, regardless of how long the job takes. Uh, why does this uh, um, 
uh, why does this uh, produce uh, optimal solution? Okay, so again, assume that you do not um, follow the greedy uh, strategy, namely always doing uh, here greedy only with respect to deadlines, right? Um, so that there are two jobs such that in this optimal solution, the job with earlier deadline was finished after a job with a later deadline. And somehow we have to show that uh, this uh, cannot be an optimal solution. So if the grid is violated, it won't be an optimal solution, right? So let us call the situation in which we do a job with an earlier deadline after a job with later deadline. Let's call this an inversion, okay? So you look at all pairs of jobs such that even though, I guess in this, from your side would be this, this job is uh, finished uh, before, so the, that even though this job is finished before that job, uh, despite the fact that uh, his deadline was after this deadline. So that's called an inversion. I, I look at all pairs that uh, uh, make an inversion. My claim is uh, if there are inversions, then there must be two adjacent uh, jobs, one immediately following the other, that also have an inversion, that are inverted. Why is this so? Does this remind you of something? So you look at jobs and uh, they are inverted, deadline earlier but finished later. And I'm claiming if this is the case, there must be two consecutive jobs that are also inverted. What is the algorithm that uh, sorts, uh, that uh, actually utilizes exactly that fact? Hmm? So assume that you have an array. Uh, and it's not in order. What is, how does bubble sort work? It goes through the list and whenever it sees inversion, immediately adjacent inversion, it swaps. And it's supposed to produce um, a sorted array. But imagine if there was a situation in which you did have inversions but no two adjacent uh, uh, were inverted. Would the uh, uh, bubble sort work? No, because it will never find two adjacent to swap, right? It's essentially a kind of, you have a function that uh, um, on integers say so that, uh, let's see, you have a function on integers So that uh, f of uh, i is uh, smaller than, uh, so this is f of i and this is f of j. Uh, so um, I claim then there must exist uh, two, and assume that all the values of f are different. There must be two adjacent places so that this is smaller than that. Why is this so? Well, if this was always decreasing, right? Uh, if this was always decreasing, at the end you will reach this point uh, and it should be smaller. So there must be, uh, if you step through this, uh, there must be a step in which this started increasing because it's larger here. 
So if there is an inversion, there must be a point in which the two, uh, the two um, uh, activities are adjacent, yet they are inverted. Now that we have uh, two adjacent activities, we can swap them without disturbing any other activities, right? Any other jobs. So late, lateness of any other jobs will be unchanged, right? Because these two guys perfectly fit. You don't have to push anything left to right. This total duration is exactly as the swap duration because there is nothing in between. So uh, no other lateness will change. But let's see what happens here. Now notice the deadline here is earlier. Finishing time is later. So the other um, job is entirely, the lateness of this job is entirely within this interval, right? So the interval, uh, the, the lateness of, uh, in this situation is this longer interval. If I swap them, right, now things will change because here this will start uh, uh, again from this place, but it will go not only up to here, but all the way up to there, right? Uh, the other one will start here, but it will finish uh, just here. So both of these guys are completely contained in the same uh, interval, right? After the swapping. But this precisely means that the largest of the two activities, uh, oh, sorry, the largest of the latencies has been reduced because here it was the entire interval and here the first activity is shorter for this much and the second, uh, I mean the first lateness is shorter, shorter for this amount of time. Here it is shorter for that amount of time. So both of them will reduce because no other lateness was changed and this particular uh, lateness is reduced, obviously, the new scheduling has smaller or equal because maybe that was not the largest uh, uh, lateness. So maybe some others have even larger uh, lateness. So we cannot say that the uh, largest lateness has dropped, but at least one of the latenesses uh, has dropped, others didn't change, so the largest here cannot be larger than the one here. So this is again, you see the, the team, you have to kind of get eventually a gut feeling for the machinery. Uh, so the team is very repetitive. You assume there is something better than the greedy, and then somehow, this is again the same story, we are morphing by uh, swapping, by bubble sorting activities. We are morphing uh, uh, these uh, uh, job schedules into greedy job schedule, always removing adjacent activities. Uh, if I proceed, uh, well, what will happen is precisely that I will bubble sort uh, the, uh, the activities uh, um, so that uh, the lateness is, uh, um, so that every activity, that an activity with a larger lateness, what am I saying here? Uh, uh, we, uh, we do it so that there are no inversions, right? So activity with the earlier deadline is done before the activity with a later deadline because this bubble sorting would sort it in exactly that order. The only way to pick up this is just by going to solving lots of problems. So I'll give you as homework and also as a practice for your midterm, I'll give you a whole bunch of greedy problems. If you solve them all, you pick up all the tricks, right? Because, you know, it's, uh, the team t tends to repeat, 
fortunately, right? The same kind of tricks or similar kind of tricks uh, that work in one case also work in another case, well, maybe with some minor tweaks, uh, but it's not a, uh, uh, some kind of ingenious solution all, all the time from scratch. Okay, let's do another very interesting uh, um, problem, right? Uh, the K clustering of maximum spacing. So assume that you have a bunch of cities, right? And uh, um, let's see, there should be an eraser around here. I, uh, trust me, eventually you are going to like doing this type of problems. Uh, it's kind of addictive, you know, just like when you learn to play chess, if you ever tried, better you get at this, more fun it is to, uh, to do it. And believe it, or contrary to what people believe, humans are naturally, we evolved to be problem solvers. Uh, so when you don't take something into an intimidating way with a kind of oh, I'm not good at that. If you just approach it with open heart and mind, we evolve to be problem solvers, and when we solve problem, we really feel, uh, I mean, literally, uh, a surge of endorphins. No kidding, that's medically proven, right? Because it's a kind of reward for, for your accomplishment. So uh, the main thing is uh, uh, not to be intimidated, and just uh, patiently work through this and uh, definitely you will be much better off at the end than when you started. So assume that you have a bunch of cities, uh, right? And uh, um, uh, you want to, uh, I guess you, um, want to split them in communities. Uh, in a most, say, K communities, say, four communities. Uh, and you want to split them in such a way you don't want to have something like this, right? You want to have them in a way uh, that these communities are maximally apart from each other so that they really cluster. So what you are looking for is uh, how to split this into, say here in this case, four communities, four points, right? So that if you measure the distances between any two points uh, that are in different communities, in different clusters, you want the minimal distance to be as large as possible. So the minimal distance to the proximity of the two communities to be as large as possible. You understand? Right, so just want to partition a set into K subsets um, uh, so that uh, the parts are as far apart as possible. So to formalize this, it need not be kind of geometric. God knows what is the distance function. So to make it uh, the most applicable, we simply consider a complete graph, uh, and the weight of the edge is the distance. We call it distance between uh, two points, right? Um, and uh, so we want to, uh, so the graph is complete because you know the distances between any two points, uh, right? Now what you want to do is uh, somehow uh, cluster them, right, so that when you look at distances at all possible points that are in different uh, uh, clusters, this is as large, the shortest one is as large as uh, possible. Okay, how do we solve this problem? Any ideas, how would you do it? Uh, does this kind of slightly remind you of something that you have seen? In fact, I think that Josh, while I was sick, uh, was showing you this. Uh, 
Does this kind of, you want things within the same cluster to be as close as possible? It is actually just the Kraskal. Of course, we will use also union fine here. So this algorithm is actually just a uh, early stopped Kraskal uh, operation. How do we do it? Uh, remember Kraskal, you start with all points uh, apart. Uh, uh, we start with all points apart. And we start running the Kraskal's algorithm to produce minimal spanning tree. At the end of Kraskal, you would get all points connected. So instead of doing that, when will you stop uh, the Kraskal algorithm? So uh, the Kraskal starts by growing forest, a forest. You have a bunch of trees that eventually um, when you go through the vertices in the increasing order of the weight of the, uh, sorry, when you go through the edges in an increasing order of the weight of the edge, uh, if uh, an edge is across two uh, sets, you join these two sets, right? So you simply, when do you stop this algorithm? Exactly, so you would stop it precisely when, if you carry the Kraskal algorithm one step more and add another edge, the number of disjoint sets would drop to k minus one, right? So it is exactly as Kraskal theorem, I mean as Kraskal algorithm, except that you stop early you don't uh, join, you don't uh, stop when uh, you get union to be a single set, right? But uh, uh, when the forest, instead of forest uh, becoming a single tree, you stop it when you have exactly k trees. Uh, now we have to prove uh, optimality because even though it's kind of similar, but it's not quite the same, why would it be that this process will in fact produce optimal clustering. And again, we need quote unquote a proof. It's not really a proof, it's a, I would rather say justification because it's more common sense than mathematics. So, assume opposite. Assume that there is a better partition so that uh, it results in shorter uh, minimal, uh, sorry, larger minimal distance, uh, right? Now, if this is the case, uh, then this partition cannot coincide with our forest of K trees, right? But what does this mean? What does this mean? If the partitions are different, then there must be points, right? Uh, uh, there must be one of the trees that leaves, uh, that intersects both of the sets. Because otherwise, if the trees uh, were each tree in the corresponding set, well, that would be exactly uh, our forest, right? So there must be at least one tree that intersects both uh, two distinct subsets of this optimal part partition. And now the same argument. You see, you have uh, a tree that has one node here and another node here. Well, these nodes can be quite apart on the tree. So what are we looking then? We are looking for two consecutive points so that one end, first one is in the first part of partition, 
the other is in the other. Because when you, if you, because it's a tree, so it's connected, you can walk from V1 to Vm. And of course, as you walk on the path from V1 to Vm, it's not the case that you stay always in S because Vm is in another, uh, uh, what is it, S2, uh, the other, right? So the moment when you switch from the first parti uh, partition, from the first subset into the second subset, you stop there. This is a good point to make an inconsistent, to, to generate uh, a... Uh, uh, contradiction. But what would it mean? It would mean that this edge vi vk plus 1 was added to the spanning, to, to this spanning forest. But the, then this distance is of course smaller than the uh, distance of the first edge that wasn't added. Right? We stopped our uh, algorithm when we achieve k many subsets, right? Uh, all the edges have weights that are smaller than the weight of the first edge that wasn't uh, added, right? But this would mean, and uh, the first edge that wasn't added was in fact the distance between the clusters, right? Because all edges with smaller uh, distances have been gone through uh, in the run of the Kraskal theorem. So this distance would be smaller than the first node added distance in the Kraskal uh, uh, algorithm, but our Kraskal, uh, sort of early aborted Kraskal algorithm produced uh, clusters with a uh, distance that is exactly the first not added, right? Because uh, um, the edges were sorted in increasing order of uh, uh, weights. And um, so all the edges are smaller distance than the first not, uh, not added, and this is clearly a contradiction. Uh, voila, this is the point in which this different partition would be worse than the Kraskal partition. <laughs> okay, so I, again, I kind of keep repeating myself. These are non-trivial things, right? I mean, maybe if you have done algorithms before, this is all a uh, piece of cake for you, but if you haven't done this kind of stuff, uh, you just have to patiently uh, go through all the examples, try to do all the problems I'll release. Well, we haven't finished everything, so probably uh, on Wednesday I'll also give you a, uh, 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 a, a bunch of, a few, we will go through a few more constructions and then we will do. Okay, let's just quickly see what's the time complexity of the algorithm. Uh, we have n squared many edges and we have to sort them according to increasing weight, right? Sorting takes n squared log n squared. But why is this equal to all of n squared just log n rather than log n squared? Exactly, log n squared is just two times log n and multiplicative constants do not matter. So first sorting takes this many steps. When we run the Kraskal theorem, we use union fine data structure and we make how many calls? Well, at most number of calls for each edge, there are n squared many of them, for each vertices you have to see whether they are in the same set, so you will make 2n squared of find operation, and at most uh, n calls of the union operation, right? Because uh, the three will at the end have uh, n minus one uh, edges, so uh, at most n calls. And uh, Josh showed you last time that uh, 
uh, with the simpler, forget about this super efficient with pad compression. For all practical purposes, this is good enough. Uh, union find, uh, uh, each uh, find operation takes log n many steps because when we merge two sets, we always take the, take the representative uh, from the larger set. Uh, so in each uh, merger, uh, the size of the resulting set uh, at least doubles, uh, so there can be at most, uh, the path can be only logarithmic, right, when you search. So altogether, this adds up to all of n squared log n. So please read the notes, and then we will do more um, next time.